at the Agape Family Worship Center. I just want to thank you for watching the sermons. It's been such a blessing to be able to do ministry through the various media outlets over the past few years. And, and we just want to thank you for your love and for your support. And we just thank God for you. But just before we get going with the message, we just want to lay before you a deep conviction that we have here at the Agape Family Worship Center that we really prayed about. And, and that's that this video sermon would really help to stir up your affections and your walking with Jesus and, and shape you and more you into the image of Jesus Christ but we also want it to be something that would be supplemental to your relationship with the Lord and in no way replace uh, the church that you should be plugged into, into or the pastor that God has put over your life to shepherd and care for your soul if you don't have a church home we'd, we'd love to have you come and be a part of Agape but please enjoy uh, the next hour or so of this message and we pray that God uh, would use it to to stir up your life and move in your life in a really profound way. God bless you. Welcome everybody and I am excited this morning because this morning we are starting part one of a series that's going to take us through August and uh, and you're not going to want to miss church over the next couple of months because it's going to be absolutely incredible. I'm really excited about what God's really been speaking to me about and the things that the Lord has been showing me and revealing me and we're, we're going to be moving into to a series this month and then next month we're moving into another series uh, that, that's going to be really incredible and so if you're, you're someone you're saying, you know, I wonder what God wants to do with my life and what God wants to, to say to me and the plans that God has for me, well, you're not going to want to miss church over the next couple of months because it's going to be absolutely incredible. This morning, uh, we're starting a new series uh, by the name of Run With The Horses, and that is actually taken from the Bible, in case you didn't know, and it's a question that God asked Jeremiah the prophet. And we're going to be going through the book of Jeremiah during the month of August. We're going to be moving through the book of Jeremiah and the life of Jeremiah and the things that God did and the things that God said to Jeremiah. And I want to dive in immediately this morning and just kind of gauge the room a little bit by show of hands this morning. And so I want to ask you a question. How many of you feel that you have a good life? If you feel you have a good life, raise your hand this morning. Amen. Lots of us feel that we have a good life. Glad to see that. Glad to see that. We feel like we have a good life. But let me ask you a question. Who decided what the standard was for having a good life? See, I, I asked each of you, and it was a very open question. I, I didn't give you sort of any markers except your own marker to decide whether you had a good life or not. I just asked you, what do you think about your own life? Do you think that your own life is good? Now, let me ask you a different question. How many of you feel that you're living in God's best for your life? Show of hands this morning. A lot less people. A lot less people. Now, this is important for where we're going this morning. Don't feel bad. Don't feel discouraged because that's why we're here today. This is really what this series is about. It's about what is God's best for me and how do I get it? Because I believe that God has great things in store for you. How many of you believe that this morning? Amen, amen. All right, show of hands, one last question. How many of you believe or feel that you are making your way towards God's best for you? You might not be there yet, but you're on your way there. Amen, amen. I like to see that. I like to see that. Many of us. So we may not have achieved it yet, but we do feel like we're on our way. And that's the start. That's a good place to be. And so that's where we're going this morning. That's what we're talking about. You know, because the life of Jeremiah is really a, 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 an interesting life. And Jeremiah is one of my favorite prophets. And, and if you've never read the book of Jeremiah before, I encourage you over the course of this month, read through the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a very interesting book. And, uh, and it's one of my favorite prophets to read. And, and, and you know, but here's the thing about the life of Jeremiah. The life of Jeremiah is not about the pursuit of happiness. It's not about the pursuit of, of getting everything that I want. It's not about the pursuit of, you know, this is what makes me happy, so I'm going to go out and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it. I'm going to get what's owed to me. That's not really what the life of Jeremiah is about. And yet that's the way that so many of us live. How am I going to get what I want? When am I going to get what I want? When am I going to get what I need? You know, I want life at its best, but when am I going to get it? 
And the life of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, is not so much about the pursuit of happiness in the life of Jeremiah as it is about the pursuit of Jeremiah that God is doing. You see, God is pursuing Jeremiah. And that's what the book is about. God's pursuit of Jeremiah. You see, because when God pursues us, it's life-changing. And we see how Jeremiah's life is absolutely changed. So the next few weeks are going to talk about the pursuit of life at its best. How do we live life at its best? And so God poses a question to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5. And this is the question where the series comes from. As a matter of fact, you may not even have realized that, that, that this was even a, a, a theme in the Bible, a question in the Bible. And I want us to read Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5. And I'm going to read it from the Message Bible just to sort of be able to unpack it a bit more so we can kind of get some depth to the scripture and what it's saying. And so God looks at Jeremiah and he says in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5, he says, Jeremiah, if you're worn out in this foot race with men, what makes you think you can race against the horses? And if you can't keep your wits during times of calm, what's going to happen when troubles break loose like the Jordan in flood? God's asking Jeremiah this really important question. He says, you're tired in the race with the footmen. How are you going to run with the horses? Do you know this morning that God has called you to run with horses, not with men? He's called you to run a race that is extraordinary. How many of us want more out of life than we're getting right now? How many of us think that, 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 that as a matter of fact, just, just from the raise of hands, I can see, I can tell that many of us are saying, you know, I don't feel, I feel like I have a good life, but I don't feel like I have a life at its best. And that's what God wants for us. How many of us feel like we're settling? How many of us feel like, like, like we're just not where we should be? You know, this, this message series is not about getting rich quick and how God's just going to snap his fingers. And, you know, if you pray enough and if you, you, you read your Bible enough and if you go to church enough, you know, God's just going to overflow your life with blessings and you'll be able to buy all the things you want and have all the nice things that you want in your life. That's not what this series is about. So if that's what, what you thought, I'm sorry to disappoint you this morning because that's, that's not what the gospel is about. And that's not what God did with Jeremiah. But yet, when we look at the life of Jeremiah, we see a young man who God takes, he molds, he shapes him into this incredible young man. And even though Jeremiah faces some very difficult things in his life, at the end of it all, Jeremiah lived life to the hilt. He lived life 100% all the way. Jeremiah was always going and getting the best. Now, now and that, I shouldn't say always going and getting the best because let's be real, there are times in life where we all kind of step back a bit. We're all going to get into those places in life where, where we're not getting 100%. But for a lot of Jeremiah's life as we read, Jeremiah was walking in the blessings of God in a tremendous way where he lived out this answer that God asked him to this question. How are you going to run with the horses if you're tired already, Jeremiah? And that's the question I hear God asking us this morning. How are you going to run with the horses if you're already tired? If you're, if you're worn out just, just running with the ordinary, how are you going to run with the extraordinary in your life? You know, I want to give us three thoughts this morning to help us as we talk about running with the horses as we talk about how, how do we, how, do, how are we even able to do that? I mean, can you imagine one day you go to the racetrack? We don't have one here in Cayman, but can you imagine going to the racetrack one day and, you know, we're, we're, and there's some horses there and, you know, they've got six, seven horses that are about to, to race against each other. And all of a sudden, it goes off and the, the gates open up and outrun these horses and running next to the horses is a guy just tearing down the track, running alongside the horses and keeping up with them. That would be absolutely incredible to see, right? I mean, it's just, it's unheard of, it's unseen. You just don't see people do that. And yet God says, this is what I've called you to do. I've called you to run beyond even what you think you are even capable 
of doing, which brings me to my first point this morning. And I want to give us three thoughts this morning to help us run with the horses. And the first thought is this. We need to raise our expectations for who God has called us to be. You need to raise your expectations of who God has called you to be this morning. You see, one of the things that I've discovered as I talk to people is that when we look at our lives, we always compare it to others. You know, look at what they have. Look at how they have it. Look at how their life is. Look at what they have in life. You know, we, we, we look at celebrities and, and people who, you know, are well-known, who, who have wealth and, and many things in life, and we elevate them and we compare them to ourselves. But not just that. When we take people in scripture and we compare those two sets of people to each other, some of us are are very often surprised at the contrast between what we see many people living out in in today's world and the people in scripture. You know, we we look at people that that are celebrities and that we elevate and and we look at this amazing life that they supposedly live, right? You know, they've got all this fun stuff that they're doing, they're traveling the world, they, they, they're adventurous, they have this amazing life, and we look at it and we go, man, I wish I could live like them. I, I wish I could, could do what they do. I wish I could have a life like, like they had it. You know, when, while me and Emily were uh, away, uh, you know, th- we, were, we were driving past down the interstate and, you know, you look and you see this big billboard that says, you know, buy a lotto ticket, $282 million. And you're like, can you imagine what you would do with $282 million? Like, I can't even fathom that. And, and you look at it and you go, if only I could be like that. If only I could, could have that. And, you know, we look at the scriptures and we, we see a completely different contrast. You know, we, we look at the scriptures and we see these non-heroic people almost with, with, with moral failures in their lives. With, and they just seem so particular, they're, they're not particularly virtuous models to model your life after. You know, when you look at, at people like David, you know, <laughs> David committed adultery and murder. You look at people like Abraham who lied, Jacob who cheated, you know, Peter blasphemed, Moses, he complained and and murdered as well. And you look at the life of these people and you go, and this is who God used? This is who, who God called? This is who we read about being heroes of our faith? And you read about these great significant people made out of the same clay that we are molded from. You read about these great people who, who, who are made ordinary, just like you and I. You see, Scripture, one of the things that's interesting about Scripture is that Scripture is very sparing in the information that it has about other people, but it's very lavish in the information that it gives us about God. It's very lavish in what it tells us about, about God. And here's the reason why the Bible does that. It does that because the Bible doesn't want to encourage fan clubs. You know, can you imagine, you know, even Paul talks a bit about this. He's, Paul says this, he says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you so that none of you could say that I am of Paul. And the reason he says that is this because the Bible didn't call us to follow after Paul, to follow after Andrew, to follow after John or Timothy or anybody else. The Bible calls us to be followers of Jesus. And the thing that the Bible doesn't want to happen is that we become fans of of, of these people in Scripture. Here's why. Here's the reason why. Because being a fan encouraged secondhand living. I'm going to live vicariously through them. I'm going to live vicariously through, through what they do. And so I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to watch how they do it and what, uh, the way that they do it, and I'm going to follow it. And, I, and I'll give you an example of this. And every time I think about this, it makes me laugh. A few years ago, I was in a store, and there was a lady standing up there reading a magazine. And on the front, I don't, I don't remember what magazine it was, but I just remember on the front, there was a picture of uh, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. And on the front of it, you know, this, I have no clue who this lady is. And she's standing in the line reading this magazine. And as she's reading this magazine, she sighs really loudly. I mean, she goes, "Ah." And I'm like, this lady must be having a tough day. 
So I said to her, I said, ma'am, are you okay? She says, yeah, I'm fine. She says, I'm just reading my magazine. I said, okay, are you, are you sure everything's all right? She says, yes. She says, I- I'm just reading about Brad and Angelina and what a wonderful life they had. She said, if only my life was like theirs. And I said to her, ma'am, why would you want your life to be like theirs? Don't you want your own? And she literally stopped for a second and paused and went like this. Huh. I guess I do. Now, that, 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 that just, it blew my mind. And every time I think back to it, I laugh. It, and we laughed about it afterwards. And I said, yeah, mom. I said, you, you know, you've, you, God has his own blessings in store for you. Why do you want what somebody else has? You see, we spend so much time looking at what other people are doing and what other people have. And God says, listen, you're looking at someone's life. You're looking at something else, someone else that you think is is more exciting, more extraordinary, more glamorous than your own because you've convinced yourself that you're just plain, ordinary old you, that there's nothing special about you, that, that that there's nothing intricate in you. Let me tell you something this morning. You were made and created in the image of God. There is nothing ordinary about you. You are an extraordinary being made by God with his image inside of you, and he's called you to live by that. Now, now everybody else, every celebrity, every, every fan we know, every person we know is made in God's image. God doesn't make junk. Everything God makes is good. You see, and in the life of faith, Scripture shows us that that each person has elements of of their own original, unique story that God is working out in their life and in your life. Your story is unique. There's no one else in this world that has your story, and no one ever will. You see, you're not called to walk in someone else's shoes. You're not called to just be a part of someone else's story. You are called into an incomparable association with Jesus Christ. And that relationship makes your life completely unique. And this is what we see in the life of Jeremiah. Because, you see, the Bible is very clear. Every story of faith is original. Because God is a creative genius. God doesn't run out of ideas. God's imagination is boundless. And God's blessings for your life, his plans for your life, his purpose for your life is boundless. And you may not be able to see it. You may not even think it's possible. But God's looking at you and saying, I have so much in store for you that you can't even comprehend or understand. So let me ask you something. Are you going to run with the footmen or are you going to run with the horses? Because I've called you to run with horses. Which one are you going to do? You see, life is a canvas and God is using all kinds of new colors and fresh lines and beautiful contrasts that we've never seen before in your life and you've never seen it before. Because God's about to do some things in you and through you that you didn't even believe was possible. You see, the people in the scriptures, you know, the reason why they are remembered is for the remarkable intensity towards which they live toward God. That's what they're remembered for. Not because they look, we looked at them and go, oh, look at how rich he was. Look at how good he can act. Look at how beautiful she is and what wonderful clothes she was. None of that. You notice the Bible doesn't tell us about any of that with any of these people. What does it tell us? It tells us about the way and the intensity that they live towards God. And that's what made them different. That's what made them unique. That's what they are remembered for. In God's word to them and his action in them. That's what they're remembered for. And this is what it means to truly live. This is what it means to live life at its best. It's to live in a remarkable intensity towards God. That's what changes life. You see, some of us have convinced ourselves that we're just here to live another day, another hour. And none of us are called to live just simply another day. None of us are called to live just simply another hour. 
Jesus said in John 10, 10, he says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Somebody say abundantly with me this morning. You see, he's called us to live abundantly. And the life that he gives us is an abundant life. And anything less than that is not what God has intended for us. You see, because God wants us to have an abundant life. And I hope this morning that this message will stir in you with dissatisfaction for anything less than your best. Because you see, I want to show you that the only way to really and truly live for anyone to live a life at our best is to have a life in radical faith to God. That's what this is about. That's what Jeremiah shows us. You see, and here's the thing is that we all need to be stretched a bit more if we're going to make it to our best. We all need to be, be guided toward excellence if we're going to make it towards the best that God has for us. You see, we, 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 none of us have made it there yet. And you see, Jeremiah shows us that it's clear that excellence comes from a life of faith. That without faith, the Bible says that it's impossible to please God, but not just that it's impossible to please God, it's impossible to live at your best. And the best that God has for you, well, you'll only get that in the life of faith. You see, Being interested in God more than self is part of how we will live at its best, life at its best. But that has, and Jeremiah shows us this, that that has very little to do with our status, our comfort, our personal achievements in life. Because see, while Jeremiah had many things that he could boast about, there were many things in Jeremiah's own life that he didn't boast about. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah was a very humble guy. And the reason he walked in that humility was because he knew that it was not about his personal comfort, his, his achievements, his, all the things he could brag about. It was about the way that he lived his life toward God. And Jeremiah lived life to the fullest without a hint of pride, without boasting in his success without personal achievement in his story, he lived completely Godward. He focused on God. And God asked him this question. You want to run with the horses, Jeremiah? How are you going to do so when you're already run, worn out running in this race with men? Life is difficult, Jeremiah. Are you going to just simply quit at the first wave of opposition that comes your way more than, you know, just eating three meals a day, Jeremiah? Is, is life just simply about getting those three meals a day and, and having a place to sleep? You know, will, will you live cautiously, Jeremiah? Or will you live courageously? How are you going to live your life? Because I've called you to live it at your best to pursue righteousness, to be driven towards excellence. This is what God called him to. See, here's the thing, is that it's easy for any person to be driven towards apathy, to be, to be driven towards just embracing the average, to just laying back and just sort of taking life as it comes. It's easy to just kind of be lulled into complacency. It's easier but it's not more fulfilling. It's not more fulfilling. And God tells Jeremiah, and God's telling you this morning, don't get worn out running with mediocrity. Don't get worn out in this life of faith by simply accepting the mediocre and the average. God says, I've called you to live life at its best. And if you're already worn out running with the footmen, with the ordinary, how are you going to run with excellence, with the extraordinary? If you're already tired, Jeremiah, you know, if you just want to shuffle along with the crowd or do you want to run with the horses? And we see that Jeremiah didn't really answer God, not verbally. He didn't say to God, God, I, I, I'll run with the horses. But when we look at Jeremiah's life, we see based on the way that he lived, that his life was the answer. His life 
became the answer. God, I'll run with the horses. Let me ask you this morning. I'm not asking you to give a a verbal commitment. I'm asking you this morning because I believe that that, that God wants to move you from where you are now. You know, basically no one said, I'm living in God's best for my life. You want to move into what God's best is for your life. So let me ask you this morning. Are you going to run with the horses? You don't have to tell me, yeah. You just need to live it. You just need to say, God, yes, I'm, I'm going I'm to run with the horses. I, I, I'm going to live life at its best, God. Because you've called me to run with horses. You know, that first point. Raise your expectations of who God has called you to be. So many of us have such low expectations of who God wants us to be. God says, step it up a little bit. Because you just think you're, you're supposed to be competing against the footmen. And God says, I've called you to run with horses. You know, that's the first point. The second point is this, is, is that we need to aim to be who you are called to become. Aim to be who you are called to become. Now, this is, this is a little bit different. You see, because from the first point, now let me, let me, let me we're going to unpack this in just a second here, but, but this is different because here's the thing is that many of us need to realize that God's called us to become more than we are right now. And what are we aiming for? Are we simply aiming for the now or are we aiming for the future? Now, let me, let me, let me show you a little bit here. Jeremiah chapter 1. As Jeremiah begins, the book begins by talking about Jeremiah. And here's what it says. This is literally how the book begins. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came. Now, when this book begins, it begins with a name. The words of Jeremiah. Now, this name, we're not told much about him. We don't know much about his background. We're not given a historical setting. We're not told of any conflict. We're not given any scenery. All we have as this book opens is a name. Here's the thing is that at our birth, every single one of us was named. This is important. We were not given a number. We were not described as an animal or as some kind of beast. We were given a name. We were given an identity. We were given a a, a thing that, that made us and identified us as uniquely human, as uniquely people. And this is what we see happen here with Jeremiah. Is the book opens and it says, these are the words of Jeremiah. Now here's the thing is that what we are named is not as significant as the fact that we are named. Just the simple fact that you have a name alone speaks to who you are. Speaks to the incredibility of your potential as a person. But here's the thing is that as we go through life, even though we have a name, we often define ourselves by labels. I'm a pastor. I'm an accountant. I'm a father. I'm a mother. I'm a this. I'm a that. Here's my passport. Here's my social security number. Here's my this. Here's my that. We identify ourselves based on what? Based on labels. Here's who who I'm for. Here is... You know, where I grew up, whatever. We label ourselves and we forget that our names are important. We forget that the fact that that, 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 that that thing that was given to us at birth is an important thing. So we, we identify and we label ourselves by all these things. We, we, we say, you know, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, I'm married, I'm divorced. All these things we go through. And we find ourselves defined in our lives by our labels. And this is important for us 
to realize. Because God didn't just call us and label us. God gave us a purpose. God gave us an identity. God says, I am helping you to become something. I'm not just labeling you as something. I'm helping you to become something. And you see, here's the thing is that none of us in this moment are complete. Not any of us in this moment are complete. In another hour, in another day, we will all have changed. We will not be the same person at the end of this sermon that we were before it. We will not be the same person tomorrow that we were today. We will all have changed. We are in the process of becoming either less or more. We are in the process of becoming either less or more. So the question then becomes, what are we becoming? What am I becoming? You know, John talks about this in 1 John. John says in 1 John 3, 2, he says, but friends, that's exactly who we are, children of God. And that's only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that even when Christ is openly revealed, we'll see him and become like him. You see, this is, this is, this is one of the things that's so incredible. Is that we are aiming to be like Christ. And Jeremiah is saying, God, even though Jesus wasn't born yet, Jeremiah is looking at God and he's saying, I want to mimic you. I want to follow you. I want to be like you, God. Now, you know, the interesting thing about Jeremiah is that there is not really a clear definition of what his name means. There's sort of two possible definitions of Jeremiah's name. And the first one is that the Lord exalts. The Lord exalts. This is the the first and probably the most common definition that is used for the name of Jeremiah. But there's another definition that is very close, and this is why it uh, becomes a little bit confusing based on the Hebrew that is used. But there's another definition that is, is close, and it's that the Lord hurls. Now, What is certain about this is that in Jeremiah's name, the Lord is in it. The the name of God is literally in Jeremiah's name. That's why it says the Lord exalts, the Lord hurls. And so maybe when Jeremiah was born, his parents looked at his life and said, maybe one day God will be exalted through him. Maybe that's why they named him Jeremiah. Or maybe they looked at his life and they said, maybe that one day the Lord will use Jeremiah like a javelin and throw him. And and that that the name of the Lord would, would, would just be, he would represent God. He would represent the things of God. And either way, no matter how his parents decided to do it, they specifically named him Jeremiah because they wanted the name of the Lord in his name as a reminder to him that God was always with him. That God is always with him. Now, in today's world, with the names that we give our kids, many times we don't even stop to think about what they mean. And we've, we've heard some, some really interesting names out there. But nonetheless, no matter what you are called this morning, no matter what your name is today, The important thing for all of us to know is that the Lord is with us just as the Lord was with Jeremiah. And he calls you his own just as he called Jeremiah his own. You belong to him. As as John said, he says, you are a child of God. And he says, and as children of God, we've been given a purpose and God has called us and God has set us apart and God has a plan for us. And the important thing is that we don't lose sight of who God's called us to be. Because so often we lose sight of that. So often we, we lose the, the vision of where, who God has called us to be, who God wants us to be, and what God wants to do in our lives. And the important thing is that, is that we remain pointed at who we are aiming to become, not who we are in this moment. You see, so many of us define ourselves in the now. 
and we forget that there was a before. We define ourselves simply as the now and we forget there, that there was a before, which leads me to my next point. It, Jeremiah teaches us that in order for us to run with the horses that we have to realize this very important point is that there has always been a plan for you. There has always been a plan for you. You know, you weren't some mistake and, and God thought you up one day and, you know, he goes, oh, this person's being born, maybe I should work something out for him. Oh, oh, oh this, this, this person, you know, oh, accident, oops. Maybe I should, you know, try to work something out in their life for them, you know, help them out a bit. It, it doesn't happen. Are we going to see what God says to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5? God looks at Jeremiah and he says, Jeremiah, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. A prophet to the nations, that's what I had in mind for you. You see, before Jeremiah was even a thought to his parents, before his grandparents even thought about having kids, before his great-grandparents even thought about having kids, God knew Jeremiah. He knew him inside and out. He knew everything about him. He knew the kind of man that he would be. God says, Jeremiah, I knew you before you were ever a thought. A man once said to me, he says, who I am is, is given to me far more than it is formed by me. For as scripture says, man cannot add a cubit to his stature. And as he said this to me, it, it, it really hit me hard because here's the thing. Who you are in this moment, who you are right now is probably who you think is the most important part of you. Yet this moment in time is only a thin slice of who you are. Who you are right now in this second is only a small portion of who you are. Because you cannot simply be understood by looking at who you are in this moment. There is a before that came. There are things that happened, and if you simply look at yourself, if I just met you as you today, if you meet someone new today, guess what? That person will lack depth. Why? Because you only understand them as who they are now. You know nothing of their past. You know nothing of their before. You simply know you see them here. That's why when you first meet somebody, you can't be best friends with them. Why? Because they lack depth and you lack depth. You know nothing of each other except what you see in the moment right now. This is why we need to look at the before. This is why when you go to a psychiatrist... This is why psychiatrists will, will talk about repressed memories and, and childhood impressions. This is why when, when you fall in love, that, you know, you, you're meeting each other's families or you go over to each other's houses and you look through those old photo albums of each other when you were kids, looking for any detail of the past just to deepen that connection. Because you, you want to make a connection that's deeper than what you have now because who you are right now can't simply be understood by this moment. It has to be understood that there was a before. There was things that happened before this moment. And instead of being told about what Jeremiah's parents' life was like before he was born, we are told what God was doing before Jeremiah was born. What was God doing? He said, Jeremiah, before I even shaped you, I knew you and I made a plan for your life. And before you were ever even a thought, before you were even shaped in the womb, before anything about you even was thought of on this planet, God had made plans for your life. And it's always been the plan. It's never just something that God dreams up and comes and says, well, you know, maybe I'll do that. No, 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 no. God already has laid his plans in stone for you because he already has plans, holy plans for your life. You see, before Jeremiah knew God, God knew Jeremiah. Before you knew God, God knew you. You see, a, a long life's journey, we, be, we become curious about God. We, we become curious about God, so we, we read books, we read the Bible. 
You know, we, we listen to songs and, and we make inquiries with other people. You know, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about God? What do you, you know, I, I heard this. You know, we, 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 we come to church and we sit here and we, we listen to a sermon preached about God. You know, we, we maybe ad- admire a sunset on the beach one day and we go, man, this is so beautiful. Look at, at, at God's creation and we, we feel a, a sense of awe and reverence towards God. But listen, before any of this ever took place, before we even thought of God as even being an important thing in our lives, God had already singled us out as being important. God had already looked at us and said, you are an important part to me. You're already an individual that I think is important. You know, to your parents, you weren't important until you were born. Tells you how much your parents love you, right? (laughs) But the minute you were born, your parents goes, I will love this child. I will raise this child. I will be there for this child. God said that long before you were even thought of. I'm going to be there for you. I will never leave you or forsake you. This book was written 2,000 years before we were even born. And guess what? The words that are spoken in it were spoken long before the world was even created. You see, God knew that you would be here. And God said, I've got a plan for you. I've got a purpose for you. I've set you apart. Just as he did with Jeremiah. Before we were even formed in the womb. We are known before we know. We are loved before we know. And you see... This reality changes things. This reality changes things because we don't need to run around searching for answers. We we, we simply come to the God who knows. We, We don't need to look for answers about life. We just simply need to come to the God who knows, who knows us intricately, intimately, inside and out. And he reveals to us the truth. And the fundamental mistake that we often make is that we begin with ourselves and not with God. And if we're going to live life at its best, then we need to be aware of the fact that we are living in a story that was not begun by us and will be concluded by another, and that is God. You see, this, this story, it didn't start with me, it started with him. Because before the foundations of the world, he knew all about you. Before the foundation of the world, he knew all about you. He shaped you and he had a plan for you. And my identity and my purpose does not begin when I begin to understand myself. See, many of us come to God and think, oh, God gives us a purpose in that moment. No, God has given you a purpose before the foundations of the world. I can't say that enough. It goes so far back. It's unfathomable for us to think about it. Because before I was formed, God knew. He knew. Before you chose God, God chose you. And he said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I have holy plans for you. I consecrated you. In case you don't know what that word consecrated means, it means to be set apart. God literally took Jeremiah and he said, I have a plan for you. I'm moving you here. I'm keeping you here, Jeremiah, because I have a purpose for you. You know, it's, it's like, you ever notice when you have something, and maybe you've got people that come over to your house and it's something you really enjoy, like it's your favorite cereal or your favorite type of food. And people come over to your house and, and maybe, you know, it's family or whatever, and they go look in your cabinets and then they see that favorite food of yours. And they go and they just decide to help themselves to the food that you have set aside for yourself. You have consecrated that food. It is yours and yours alone. It's not for anybody else. I know we're laughing, but I mean, it, it, I'm serious. That is literally what God did with Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah, you are mine. I've set you aside. I've set you apart. You are mine. Nobody else is, is, is to touch you. You're mine. This is what God does with us. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I, I was horrible at basketball. And not that I'm much better these days, but I can at least dribble the ball. Much, I was always much better at running than I was at playing basketball. And I remember one day in PE, in high school, they were, you know, divided and they had two captains. And, and uh, the two captains would then choose everybody. And I remember this one time after the first week when I played so bad, we came back the second week, nobody wanted to choose me to be on the team. Yeah, go ahead and laugh at, at, at my, you know, this is, I need counseling for some of this, you know. And I remember standing there and literally, you know, the kid that everybody teased and called a nerd got chosen before me. And I was standing there and I'm going, they, they, they pick him and they're fighting over who going to pick me? And I'm standing there watching this and I'm going, man, this is, this is a horrible feeling. Like nobody wants me in their team. And as I watched this happen, I, 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 was, I was just in amazement. I was like, wow. <laughs> I don't know that I really want to play basketball today. Maybe I should just go sit down. Here's my point. I didn't feel wanted. I didn't feel like I had a place. I, I, I didn't want to want to go anywhere. And, you know, one of my friends was the captain. He kind of took pity on me. He's like, all right, come, come play with us. I was like, no, it's all right. You guys go ahead and play. I'll just sit on the sidelines. I didn't feel like I had a place. And, and you may feel like that in your own life right now. That you don't have a place, like, like you're not wanted, like, like you don't have a purpose, like, like you're here and you're just simply existing, like it's just going day to day and nobody wants you, nobody wants anything from you, you just, you're just there. And I want you to know this this morning, you've been set apart. You've been chosen before you were even born. You have been consecrated and set aside for a purpose that only you can fill. A place that only you can stand in. You see, there's no substitute for you. There's no replacement for you. There's, there's no one else that can do it the way you can do it. There's no one else that God wants to do it because he's chosen you. He's set you apart. He's consecrated you for this purpose, for this plan. And before I was good for anything, God decided I was good for him. And before you were good for anything, God decided you were good enough for him. And God says, I've got a plan for you because, you see, God is not just simply out to just choose anything or anyone. God is out to win the world with love. And each person has been selected in the same way Jeremiah was selected. You know, we read this book and we see this great prophet and this great man, but he understood one thing, that he was made by God, called by God, and given a purpose by God. And that was it. And he was going to fulfill that. He was going to live by that. And that's what each of us needs to do. You know, it, it wasn't about the entrance exam. How good am I going to do? It's not about your personality, despite what people might tell you. It's about the fact that you have been chosen, each and every one of you, regardless of personality regardless of the status of your bank account, regardless of, of whether you feel like you are up to the task or not, God has said, I have formed you, I know you, and I have called you. And you have a plan for your, I have a plan for your life. I have a purpose for your life. You know, God doesn't stop to wait to figure out how you're going to turn out before he decides you know, we, we, when, we, when we go for, for, for an interview or when we're talking to people or when, you know, we want to promote someone, let's see how it goes. Let's see how they turn out. Maybe this will be good for us. Maybe it won't. God doesn't do that. God just says, hey, I've chosen you for the job. Come here. I, I, I've set you apart. Come here. I've got a plan for you. Go there. God doesn't wait to decide. He has already chosen. And he chose us before we were born, and then he does what he does best. He gives us. He gives us. Because God is lavishly 
generous. He gives us. That's the greatest thing that God could ever do. He gives us to our parents. He gives us to our families. He gives us to our community. He gives us to the body of Christ. He gives us. And he gave Jeremiah as a prophet to the nations before Jeremiah even got his life together, before Jeremiah was even born. I mean, can you imagine, you know, you're, you're 18 years old or you're 14 years old or however old you are, and your parents look at you one day and say to you, hey, um, I've already made the plans for your life. Don't worry, I've already kind of sold you off. Here, go and do this. That's basically what God told Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I've already set you apart and decided everything for you before he was even born. I don't want us to think that this is something that, you know, God just does and, and, and it's like, what? Well, because God did it with his own son. He did it with Jesus. He gave Jesus to the nations. He gave Jesus to us. When we read John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the what? The world. That he did what? He gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. This is what God does. God gives. And when he gives, he gives us. He gave Jesus because God gives. I want to close this morning with a story. One of the most amazing stories I've ever heard, so simple yet so profound. And I'm gonna to try to stick to my notes a little bit here because I'm not 100% familiar with the story, but I wanna to, to sort of read for you and talk, talk you through this. But there was a story that is told of some swallows, the birds. And in the story of these swallows, they were on a cliff face and on the cliff face, there was a crack in the cliff where a branch was sticking out of that hung over a lake. And the branch was about maybe four feet above the lake. And there were three baby swallows that were just born. And the time came for them to be fed. And, and so their parents come and they begin to feed them. And this went on for a few hours until one of the parents had finally had enough of this and decided that they were not going to feed the baby chicks anymore. And, and so they begin to shove the baby chicks out onto the branch. And the first chick comes and, and, and the, the parent shoves it onto the branch and nudges it off the branch and, and the, the swallow falls off and, and immediately begins to flap its wings and, and it flies away. The second one comes along, the same thing happens. The, the mother or father pushes it off the branch and it begins to flap its wings and it flies away. And then the third one comes and he sees that there's a pattern. And not having it as the parent nudges him out onto the branch with his talons, he was not having it and he gripped the branch and refused to let go. And so the parent deciding that this was not good enough for them, begins to peck at the feet of this baby swallow and begins to peck and peck and peck. And the parent pecked the chick until it was more painful for the chick to hold on to the branch than it was for the chick to let go of the branch. And the parent pecked and pecked and pecked until the chick could not hold on anymore. And the grip was released. The bird fell off and started to fly. Now the parent knew that the child would fly. The parent knew that, that, that there was no danger in making this bird do what it was designed to do. Now, birds have feet and they can walk. Birds have talons to, to grasp onto things securely, yet flying is what they do best. They are known not for their ability to walk on the ground, but they are known for their ability to fly. 
And it's not until they fly that they're living at their best. It's not until they fly that they are doing what they were, were made and designed to do. You see, giving is what God does best. And giving is what we do best. We cannot live life at its best until we are willing to give. God gives away everything. God made this world. He made Adam. He made Eve. He said, this world is yours. God gave us creation. God gave us his son. God gives us everything. He, the Bible says that he does not just give us a portion of himself, but that he gives us all of him. God gives everything away, and the only way for us to live at our best is to give everything to God. Give yourself to God. Give yourself to his call in your life. Give yourself to his purpose in your life. Because you see, for many of us, we're like the bird hanging on to the branch. And God is saying, if you would simply let go, you would do what you are made to do. You see, because we are so caught up in running with the footman. And God's saying, I didn't make you to run with footmen. I made you to run with the horses. So which one are you going to do? But the only way to do that is to give yourself completely to God. Thanks for watching today's sermon. We pray that you were blessed by today's message and we hope that this message has helped to stir up your affections for Jesus and challenge you in your walk with God to help you transform more into the image of Jesus Christ. You know, we, we do this because we want to help lead people into this amazing relationship that we can have with God through Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible tells us in John 3, 16 that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. It also tells us that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And so if that's you today and you want to confess your sins before God and you want to come into this amazing relationship that we can have with Him through Jesus Christ, then pray this prayer with me. Lord, I come before you. I surrender my life to you today. I ask that you would give me your grace and your mercy. I repent of my sin. I turn away from it and I turn towards you. And I ask that you would save me and that you would set me free today by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer today and you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ today for the first time, we'd love to hear from you. And if you, you wanna learn more about this amazing relationship that we have with God and that you've just started with God, you can give us a call here at our office at 345-949-2539 and we'd be happy to talk to you more about that relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. If you're looking for a church, we'd be happy to have you come here and join us at the Agape Family Worship Center. Also, if you're looking for more information about us, you can visit us on our website at www.agapecayman.ky. God bless you.